you all sound wonderful. Um, the text for today comes from Luke chapter number 24. And in typical Resurrection Day fashion, it begins with a trip to the tomb by some faithful women, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James. And so Luke chapter number 24, verse number 1. The Bible says now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But, and I love that word. It's such a big word in the Bible. It means shift. It means transition. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in, and they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid, they bowed their faces to the earth, and they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. I think these women had such great faith. If you saw two men in shining garments... At, you didn't know where they came from. Would you stay there and like kind of bow to the ground or would you take off? I'd be like, gone. But they, they, they stayed there. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but he's risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again? And then they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself what had happened happened you know what had happened was let's pray father in the name of jesus would you minister to each and every one of us i pray in jesus name amen the part of the text that kind of jumped out to me is verse number eight where it says and then they remembered his words you say pastor well why did that jump out to you well in light of what's happening right now with the virus everything is canceled the NBA season suspended more than canceled, but canceled. The start of the Major League Baseball season canceled. Large gatherings of every kind canceled. School canceled. Hugs canceled. Handshakes canceled. Eating out canceled. Broadway shows canceled. Haircuts canceled. Some of you are looking real rough right now. You need to find a way to get that taken care of. Even Swipe Night's international rollout with Tinder has been canceled. You're like, what is that? Sorry, desperate singles. You know what that is all about. And Easter services in person also canceled. The scripture says, then the disciples remembered what he said. Here's what he said. Verse number seven. The son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day will rise again. The disciples, because of their crisis, and you and I, because of our crisis, maybe have forgotten the most important fact in the history of all mankind, and that is that he is risen. And today I want that truth to echo in your hearts and in your minds and throughout your house. I want you to know this, that the resurrection has not been canceled because of their pain they forgot what jesus promised because of their crisis they forgot what christ had predicted because of what they were dealing with they went through it as if christ was really dead but i want to remind you that the resurrection is not canceled and the same god who used his power to minister to them when they thought it was over them then is the same god that is available to us today to put his resurrection power on display and so i want to give you five truths today that you can bank on because the resurrection has not been canceled number one the resurrection has not been canceled so you can bank on Seeing him in unlikely pe people. Seeing him in unlikely people. Did you notice that the text says it was Mary Magdalene as one of the three original people that God selected to preach 
the good news of the gospel to those who were filled or overtaken with bad news. Mary Magdalene was one of the original three who gave that message of resurrection hope to a world that was hopeless at the time. And she was such an unlikely person for God to use. Second century Greek philosopher and opponent of the early church and Christianity by the name of Celsus said this of Mary Magdalene. He said, how can anyone expect rational men to listen to the testimony of a hysterical female? And uh, you remember when she went and she told the disciples, they said it was an idle tale. What was Celsus referring to? Well, we all know that the Bible was written in a very misogynistic period of time where women were thought to be second-class citizens and really not believable and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And so if anybody was trying to make up an event, they certainly wouldn't use a woman to be the first eyewitness to testify to the truth of the event because if you wanted to be taken seriously in Bible times and the history of what you were saying to be recorded properly, it would never come through a woman. So then why was Mary Magdalene one of the first eyewitnesses to the resurrection? Because she really was and because it really did happen. And why did God divinely put this detail in the scripture to let us know that we can find him in the most unlikely people? According to Luke chapter number 8, Mary Magdalene was a woman who Jesus cast seven demons out of. What would be the profile of a woman that had seven demons cast out of them? Somebody said, that would be my mother-in-law, Pastor. No, no, just, just kidding. Hang on there for a second. Surely it would be somebody who would be crazy. Somebody who would be unimportant. Somebody who would be overlooked. Somebody undervalued. But this is the person who Jesus selects immediately following the resurrection to share his message. Why? Because the resurrection tells us in times of crisis, we can be confident that we will find God in unlikely places and people especially. See, right now, he is working through unlikely people. The new heroes of humanity are doctors and our nurses. Those that are often overworked and undervalued and underappreciated are now the healing hands of God ministering to people. He's working right now through a Congress and a government that just three or four weeks ago was at a stalemate and doing nothing, but God is working through them right now. He's working right now through the military and armed forces. They are moving stuff into place. They are bringing ships to be hospital, hospitals. They are erecting medical facilities in days. They are mobilizing uh, resources to go to certain places. God is working through them. He's working right now through billionaires who are donating all this money to find a cure and do research. He's working right now through scientists and epidemiologists. Some of them love Jesus. Some of them don't even believe there is a God. But he's working through them all. Because he's the one that gave them smarts and intellect and resources and wisdom and insight and money and all of those kind of things. And it's God working through unlikely people right now. Because the resurrection is canceled, you can bank on the fact that you'll find God working through unlikely people. It reminds me of this, this joke that I heard recently. There was this little old lady and every morning that she would get up, she'd go on the front of her porch and she'd raise her hands to heaven and she'd say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And she'd make a real big fuss about the Lord. Well, one day an atheist moved in next door to her. And he got a little tired of hearing her say, praise the Lord or thank you, Jesus, every morning when she got up. And so he would go out there every morning. And every time she would say, praise the Lord, he'd say, there is no God. She'd say, praise the Lord, there is no God. And this went on for like months and months and months. And it was the dead of the winter. The little old lady, she got up, she went out in front of the porch, and she raised her hands to heaven. She said, praise the Lord. She said, Lord, I have no groceries, but I'm asking you to provide for me. And she went back inside, and the atheist overheard the whole thing. And so he said, I'm going to fix her. The next morning, she got up. She found these two big, beautiful bags of groceries on her front porch. And she said, praise the Lord, God has provided for me. And the atheist jumped out from behind the bushes and said, that wasn't God, that was me. She held her hands up to heaven. She said, praise the Lord, God provided me with groceries. And he used the devil to pay for it. You see, God is working through all sorts of people right now. Some people who don't even believe that there is a God, but God is at work through them. And because the resurrection is not canceled, we can bank on the fact that we'll find God working through unlikely people. 
But the second thing that we can bank on because the resurrection has not been canceled is we can expect him to minister to each and every one of us personally. Of all the people that God could have picked to preach the good news to those who had given up, he picked Mary, this former demon-possessed, out of her mind, hearing voices, crying out in public, social outcast. Why of all the people would God pick her? Because God wants each one of you to know that not one of you is overlooked by him. Not one of you is forgotten by him. He feels your pain. He knows your entire story. He knows when you're scared. He knows when you're sick. He knows when your heart hurts. He knows when you're mourning. He knows when your life is filled with tears. He knows you're rising up and you're lying down. He's got every one of your hairs numbered. He knows everything about you. He knows your inward parts. He formed you when you were in your mother's womb. He knit you together. He designed you, crafted you, built you. He made a mold and then he threw it, threw it away. It would never be used again. He knows what makes you tick. He knows what you've made public and posted on Facebook and Instagram and what you've kept secret. God knows you intimately. The resurrection hasn't been canceled. You can count on him ministering to you personally. In John's gospel, we find greater detail about our resurrected Savior's interaction with Mary. In John's gospel, we know that he appears to Mary as a gardener. And Mary is so filled with tears, she's so filled with pain that she misses God's promise. And by the way, don't miss God's promises in this moment where everybody is going through a pandemic. Don't let what's happening blind you from seeing what God has promised for you. And so he appears as a gardener. Mary doesn't know it's him. And she says to him, sir, please tell me where you laid him. And in John's gospel, the 20th chapter, the 16th verse, Jesus responds. He says, Mary... And she turned to him and she said, Rabbi, he called her by name. A resurrected Savior ministered to her personally. I've got good news for every single one of you who are watching right now. Every person, every one of you who's sick right now. Every one of you who lost a job right now. Every one of you who owns a small business that's struggling right now. Every one of you who has lost a loved one right now. Every one of you who is depressed right now. And every one of you who is blessed right now. Here's the good news. God knows you by name. And because the resurrection has not been canceled, you can expect that he is going to minister to each one of you personally at your point of need. He knows you by name. He wants to walk with you, to talk with you, to tell you that you're his own. He wants to comfort you and counsel you and in his presence make you brand new. And because he knows your name personally, as the song says, no fire can burn you. No battle can turn you. No mountain can stop you. No virus can hold you because he knows your name. And although this is not the end of the service right now, I've asked the worship team to stay up here because right in the middle of the message, I want to burn that truth in your heart that the God of heaven knows each one of you by name and because the resurrection has not been canceled, that you can count on him ministering to you personally. Come on, would you sing it with the worship team? He knows your name.
about that. Mary opened her eyes through the tears. She saw her gardener. She didn't know it was Jesus. Sir, tell me where you laid him. Mary, Rabbi, he knows your name. He knows your situation. And because the resurrection has not been canceled, you can count on him ministering to you personally. I want you to remember that right now, no matter what your situation is. God hasn't forgotten about you. God's not going to leave you or forsake you. He's going to walk with you every step of the way. Amen. The resurrection has not been canceled. There's three other points that I want to give you, but I want that one to sink in deep. The third thing I want you to realize as you realize the resurrection has not been canceled is because of it, you can find him in unlikely places. You can see him in unlikely people. You can find him now in unlikely places. Most times, pain is not from God. And this pandemic is certainly not from his hand. His hand is the hand that's reaching out. His hand is the hand that's healing. It's the hand that's curing. It's the hand that's saving and delivering and providing. This is not God's doing. It's demonic in every single way. But nevertheless, God often uses our pain or the pain of our problems as a platform for us experiencing his presence. Pain, as bad as it is, many times produces in us a longing for the God that we so often push aside. And it's so often in the place of pain that we find the Prince of Peace, Mary Magdalene. Joanna and Mary, the mother of Jesus, discover the empty tomb. They run to tell Peter and John what they discovered. And since it was before the Lord appeared to them, John's gospel says they said they've stolen the body of our Lord. And so Peter, already in pain, he, he, he runs to the tomb. He's already denied his Savior, and he's dealing with the regret of that. At his moment of need, he, he denied who he was, and so he runs to the tomb filled with pain. And John runs along with him, the one that Jesus loved. They run off to the place where their pain would be personified. And when they get to the place of pain, it looks ransacked. The stone is rolled away. The, the body is gone. And, and grave clothes are laid inside. And it looks like a crime scene. It looks like somebody has dishonored the body of their loved one. And the pain that they probably feel at the initial onset of seeing this is like somebody took a knife and not only stabbed him with it, but turned that knife. Because now what has happened to his body? We can't even mourn right. As they get there, their pain is personified by a tomb that looks like it's been robbed. But as Peter steps inside, his pain turns into perplexity. He looks around and he sees the grave clothes lying there. The linen strips that embalmed the body of Jesus that had been dipped in and plastered on his body with a hundred pounds of different ointments to, to mask the decomposing smell of the body are all taken off of the body and they're laying there on the floor and Peter looks and he thinks to himself inwardly, what kind of thief would take the time to unwrap the body with all of these linen strips? Who would do that? It would take too long. He looks further and he sees a napkin and it's folded and it's nightly nicely put in place and he thinks who would take the head dressing or the, the part that covered the embalmed body's face and take the time to fold it? What thief would take the time to organize the crime scene before leaving the crime scene and suddenly in his pain he feels this presence that begins to cause an overwhelming peace to come upon him a presence that says it's not what it looks like it's not what it appears to be don't don't let don't let the circumstances fool you and right now i think that's what god is saying it's not what it looks like it's not what it appears to be it's not a setback but it's a setup it's not permanent have patience God is still going to move. I want to remind you that oftentimes it's our place of pain where we experience his presence and his promises the most. 
I want to let you know what is happening all around us is demonic, but God in his goodness uses the pains that are meant to destroy us, and he turns them into moments where we meet in a deeper way the Prince of Peace. And here's what I believe is going to happen. I believe God is going to, for many of you, uh, renew your faith and your trust in his presence, that you are going to realize that, that God really does never leave you or forsake you, and some of you are going to realize that his presence is always being before you and behind you and beside you and within you and all around you that some of you are going to realize that God's presence is there especially when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death you're going to realize that because of God's presence there really is no reason to fear you're going to realize that his rod and his staff they comfort you his rod to prod away what tries to attack you and his staff to pull you close when pain tries to distance you. Some of you are going to have such a renewed relationship with God that a presence, that a table is going to be set in the presence of your enemy. Your place of pain is also your greatest place of realizing God's presence. The resurrection hasn't been canceled. And God wants me to remind you that because of that, you're going to experience his presence in ways that you never would have otherwise. The pandemic was sent to paralyze us with pain. But here's what I believe. I declare that God is going to use it to bring people to their knees where they will meet the Prince of Peace. I believe that the pandemic is going to spark revival. I believe that the pandemic will bring more people to Christ than people will be killed by COVID-19. I declare that the place of pain is going to be a place where people meet the resurrected Prince of Peace. The resurrection's not canceled. But then number four, because the resurrection is not canceled, I believe you can count on God doing something powerful. I kind of already hinted at this, but let me make it plain. God operates in patterns. I don't say that to diminish the sovereignty of God. I don't say that to bring us up on the same plateau as God. God is God and we're not. And I'm glad about that. I'm glad that God is smarter than us. I'm glad he's more powerful than we are. I'm glad that, that God operates at levels sometimes that are too big for us to completely wrap our pea brains around. I'm glad that God can do what we can't do. I'm glad that when man comes to the end of his rope that God can step in at times like that. God is God and we're not. And so when I say God works in patterns, I'm not at all diminishing the sovereignty of God, but he does work in patterns and those patterns are predictable on purpose. I believe that God works in patterns so that we can have an expectation of him doing certain things on our behalf. And the scripture tells us this over and over again. Amos chapter 3 verse number 7 says, Surely the Lord, God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. In Psalm 103 verse number 7, it says, He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. And so let me say it again. God operates in patterns so that we could know him and be able to expect certain things from him. And so let me give you some of the patterns. He operates by the pattern of sowing and reaping. Therefore, I know that if I sow generously, I'll reap from his generous hand. Therefore, I know if I, if I forgive somebody that God will forgive me. I know if I do something kind in the name of Christ for somebody that God promises to make sure that happens for me. God operates in patterns. The pattern of praise and presence. When a praise goes up, his presence comes down. When I put on the garment of praise, the spirit of heaviness leaves. God operates in patterns. The pattern of choice and consequence. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse number 19. I lay before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. The pattern of repentance and intervention. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse number 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways uh, and repent of their sins, then I'll heal their land. Then I'll forgive them and heal their land. The pattern of repentance and intervention. Acts chapter 3, verse number 19. Repent, therefore... 
and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out and times of refreshing may come from the Lord. The pattern of repentance and intervention, the pattern of call and answer. Jeremiah 33, verse number 3, call on to me and I will answer you. Joshua called to God and the sun stood still. Joshua called out to God and the walls of Jericho came down. Moses called out to God and the Red Sea parted. Elijah called out to God and fire and rain came out of heaven. David called on to God and Goliath went down. Daniel called on to God and he shut the mouths of the lions. Jonah called to God and the whale spit him up on dry land. Stephen called out to God and God received his spirit as a standing ovation into heaven. The pattern of calling an answer. When we look in the scripture and in our text, we see another pattern. The pattern of pain and power. When we come to the tomb, we see pain all around. They got up early and went to the tomb because they, they couldn't touch him or prepare his body on the Sabbath, so they had to wait. Pain. The stone was rolled away when they got there, and they couldn't find the body of Jesus. Pain. Where did you lay my Jesus? Pain. Sir, please tell me where you put him. Pain. They have stolen the body of our Lord. Pain. Peter and John ran to the tomb. Pain. John wouldn't step in and he waited for Peter because pain. The other disciples stayed hidden at home for fear of their lives. Pain. Thomas said, I won't believe unless I touch the, his hands and put my fingers in the scars. Pain. John held Mary, the mother of Jesus, as she watched her son die. Pain, pain, pain. Wherever you look, pain. But just as pain had begun to sit like a cloud of darkness over the hearts of God's people, the angel said, Luke 24, verse number 5, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. I see a pattern right now in our world that gives me great anticipation and expectation. I see people showing kindness. I see people starting to lift the praise. I see people making better choices. I see people coming to repentance. I see people calling out to the God of heaven. And I see a world in pain and agony. And this tells me when there's pain all around that you and I better get ready. As C.D. Jakes would say, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Because the backdrop of pain pain is a place for God to release his power. I see a time when God's church is getting ready to rise up. I see a time right now against this painful backdrop where power is beginning to flow through the church. They're going to be about his father's business. I see power overshadowing the pain. I see power pushing aside evil. I see power producing a spiritual shift and power that's about to go prime time. You and I better to get ready because wherever there is pain, there is a pattern of God's power. Power from pain. Just like they're predicting based on the pattern that they see. They look at the curve and the curve gives them certain predictions and the more data that they get, the more they can accurately predict what's about to happen. Well, I've walked with God for just a little bit of time now. And I can tell you this, talking to some of the other people that have also walked with God. We have data that has come in over the years. And the data that has come in over the years and the data that has been personified and is right there in the text for us is that wherever there is mounting pain against humanity, God is getting ready to set forth his power. Get ready for his power. It's going to come. It's going to be released. The shift is already beginning to happen. Have you noticed it? Just in case you wonder if the prayers of the saints are working right now. It was 2.2 million deaths. Then it was between 100,000 and 200,000. And now they're saying maybe 60,000. I'm believing it's still going to go low. Is it terrible that anybody's going to die? Yes. But see, the prayers are working. And the power is coming. And here's what I'm going to I want you to believe this with me. That if 60,000 people die, that more than 60,000 people will come to know Jesus as a result of this. Where there is pain, there is power. You can expect him because the resurrection is not canceled to do something powerful. And then lastly, number five, we're teaching in fives because the resurrection is God's grace personified to us. Because the resurrection was not canceled, you can trust him for the ultimate promise 
For this last point, I want to leave our text and I want to go to John's gospel, the 11th chapter in the 25th verse. Jesus said to her, who's her? Her is Mary, a different Mary. This is Mary, the sister of Lazarus. Lazarus who has died. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. Here's what Jesus was saying. I paid the price for you. I went to hell for you. I was separated from the Father for you. I died on the cross for you. I became sin for you, and then I defeated death for you. Why? So that you can have life after you die. Tragically, the virus has taken people's lives. More people will die, but here's, what I, here's the good news. This life is not the end. Though you may die, yet shall you live. Jesus came to give you eternal life. Only he is the resurrection and the life. He is not a way. He is the way. Remember what he said in John chapter 14, verse 6? He said, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father, but through me. What qualifies him to be the way? Listen, listen. The resurrection. Nobody else in the history of mankind has ever defeated death permanently. Jesus did because he's the author of eternal life. And I love that our text tells us that it was Mary who he chose to pay, play this central part in the resurrection story. Why did God choose her? Because her life shows us that we can only be saved by grace. He didn't save her because she was good. She was the worst of the worst. She was demon possessed. She had nothing to offer. She didn't earn her way into God's good graces, but he saved her by his grace. Here's what I want you to understand. The promise of eternal life is the greatest of all promises. And because the resurrection has not been canceled, you can trust him for the ultimate promise. Listen to it again. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. If you'd like to surrender your life to Jesus as the worship team comes. I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Say, how do I know if I need to surrender my life to Jesus Christ? Do you know with absolute certainty that if you leave this earth today, that you would wind up in eternity in a place called heaven? And if you don't, that means that you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. He is the resurrection and the life. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, Today I repent of my sins and I receive Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. If you prayed that simple prayer, you received the greatest gift that you could receive in life, the reason why Jesus came, so that you could have eternal life. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want you to click the raise your hand button if you're watching on Church Online. If you're watching on one of the other social platforms, either Facebook or Instagram or YouTube, you can type in the chat, Jesus, and one of our moderators will reach out to you. I want to encourage you to keep coming back, same time, same bat channel, every single week to this particular feed, this location, and we're going to preach you the good news of the gospel right to the other side of this thing. I want you to know that the resurrection has not been canceled. The same God that defeated death 2,000 years ago can defeat this virus that is now trying to kill all of God's creation. He is for you. He's with you. And here's what I declare over your life, that you are going to see a victory. Thanks so much for watching, but don't just stop there. Click the Watch Live button in the description below to join us for Faith Church Online every Sunday morning. And while you're there, you can set a reminder to come back Sundays at 9 and 11. If you'd also like to learn more about getting involved here at Faith Church, you can click the Connect button. And be sure to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss a single video and maybe even share it with a friend. Thank you again for watching. And as always, remember, with Jesus, you are destined to win.